Hello. And Hi. Uh, good morning, good evening, and um, good afternoon, wherever you are. So we have another wonderful photographer as our guest today. He's an award-winning photographer, and I love the way he played with light. So the photographer is Chaitanya. Let me introduce him and let, let, let's listen to him through his eyes, his views, and his photography. Hello. Can you hear me OK, Nisha? Yes, we can hear you. Brilliant. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction. Um, so good again, you know, good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. It's really a pleasure to be um, being able to share my work with Pose Trails. Um, you know, Nisha and her team kind of got in touch with me a few weeks ago, and we've been in discussion since then. Absolutely yeah. love the work um, you guys do. I've been going through your newsletters, through your website, of course, through all your posts on social media. Um, really, really impressed, and, and I hope I can join you on the field on uh, you know one of these um, trips uh, and safaris. Yeah, absolutely, kind of really commendable because I know how difficult it is. Um, your passion for for wildlife really shines. Okay, so I must I must say that before I talk about my my own work. Um, Thank you. So, as I said, very very good to be here, and you know. Um, always a pleasure to be able to share my photography journey. Um, you know, I've, I've had a look at, you know, some of the others who've been here and, and everyone is really engaging. Everybody has a very distinct style and everybody, you know, loves their wildlife. And that's why I'm here because uh, I love wildlife uh, and I love wildlife photography. Um, let, let me, you know, start with kind of where it started because not often do you directly get into kind of you know serious photography and this is still by the way a, a hobby and a passion for me so uh fortunately um or unfortunately i haven't you know left my my day job um but you know i absolutely love doing this so so maybe one day you know uh, i can focus uh, full time 100 percent on this so um i can remember you know the the times when um uh, we had these re cameras with with uh, film reels. So so back in the nineties, I remember playing with my parents' old uh, Konica Minolta. I distinctly remember being in uh, Bangalore Zoo at that time. Uh, you know, taking taking photos of um, of the elephants. And I remember I spent thirty six photos. Nowadays, thirty six photos on a digital camera is absolutely nothing. But I remember spending one whole reel um you know uh, taking photos of one elephant because you know it was the biggest one there massive tusks and you know um fully grown nation elephant so um and you know that's where it started but of course uh, we all know photography as such in india especially from a uh, from an affordability point of view is not something that you know you can do uh, you know immediately so so i had to wait until you know i got into the let's say the corporate world started earning my own money and then really invest in in the cameras and lenses that i wanted to be able to uh, do the types of photos i wanted because uh, i mean the first thing you think of with wildlife photography of course is big lenses and all of that i'll talk about that a little later but you know it's the first thing you think of and and you know of course you, you need money for that so um started uh, in the early 2000s with a bridge camera, definitely not an SLR first, it was a Fuji bridge camera 2004 or five, you know, started doing a few things here and there. Again, on weekends, I remember I'd gone to um, this sanctuary near Gurgaon, I, I, uh, Sultanpur, is that a sanctuary? Sultanpur bird sanctuary near Gurgaon? Yes. Um, yeah, so I don't know how what state it is in now, but at that time I remember going there. I was the, you know, me and my friend, just two of us, we were the only ones, you know, nobody really there. Uh, I think photography had kind of just kicked off in India. Of course, you had some big photographers even then, but the way it is now really did, didn't happen 16, 17 years ago. So went there, took a few photos. Unfortunately, I've lost those photos. I can't, I can't share, share it with you now. Um, but, um, and then, you know, as you kind of do, you, you, I was based in the north, went to Rishikesh, Haridwar, you know, whitewater rafting, going to the mountains, 
trips with friends. So you take, you know, landscape and people photos and things. Uh, and that, you know, went on for a bit. Uh, I then moved to, to the Middle East again, um, did some photography there. And, and once I started going out a bit uh, in terms of travel, uh, I also went to, uh, I, I know Pause Trails does a few, the, you know, tours in, or you're based, I think, in, in East Africa. So went uh, for a few, um, for one trip at least there, took a few photos. But again, you know, nothing to write home about, nothing that I was too happy with because you know you only you always compare with some of the other photos you see online and elsewhere and of course it's it's difficult to match that immediately when you're just starting out um and and um you know then um again from the middle east i, I moved uh, to the uk so based in in in, in london um, and what really got me started, funnily, on my photography journey was not really wildlife. What really got me started was the 2012 Olympics in London. Um, so here was an event that was global, you know, and of course, every city makes a big noise about it. And, you know, uh, London was the same, you know, lots of uh, international media athletes, the stadiums and, and, you know, the events and all of that. Um, and I just bought my new SLR at the time and I said, okay, you know, I, I, I must make full, to take full advantage of what's happening here, such a big global event. So, um, and I was lucky to get some tickets as well to, to watch the Olympics. So, so I decided, okay, let me uh, go to the stadiums, go to the opening ceremony from outside. I mean, I remember lugging around quite a bit of, you know, uh, you know, you start out tripod and lenses and the bag and everything, you know, going around, taking photos. Um, did a bit of that uh, for, for the two or three weeks that the whole, you know, Olympics was here. Got some, you know, decent shots, uh, shared them in the past, you know, off the athletes doing gymnastics and all that. Uh, so that really got me started saying, and, you know, got contacted by a couple of media agencies saying, oh, good pictures, you know, do you want to have them published here and there? Uh, as usual, you know, you get the exposure to start with, right? You're not getting any money out of it, <laughs> just the exposure. Um, so did that. And then when it was over, I'm like, okay, now what, right? Um, and that's, that's how then I want to kind of then share with you, uh, you know, my pho photography journey now through, through the slides, if that's okay, Nisha. So yes. from there to where I'm now, you know, how I've, I've kind of grown in terms of my photography. So, um, uh, any questions so far, Nisha, anything you want to discuss? No, further? Yes, yes. The hi, hi from, uh, Sinto Anto. Hi, hi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I shall stop you in between in case if I we have some questions, otherwise uh, we can. Sure. Continue. Great. So I've talked about how I started out, right? And then yeah. you know, once um, once um, you know, I was in London, and then as you do, you know, you want to travel on holidays and things. And I said, you know, okay, um, I have my camera, and let's let's see what uh, what I can do with it on on my travel. So everywhere I went, you know, I I took my camera with me, and and I thought I'll share some photos because you will see that um they're not always wildlife photos right and i want to tell you the journey and how i you know came to be more of a you know wildlife photographer so this is iceland right um as you do you know everybody uh in europe who, who, who's interested in photography and and you know landscape is a, is a big part of the photography scene out here in europe so was in iceland you know absolutely loved it took all the photos i wanted absolutely stunning light um and you know th that's when this idea started coming to me is this this is all great right everybody or you know you'd hope at least a photographer who who knows what what he's or he or she is doing um can get these kinds of photos right i mean uh, you have to of course be there get there on you know at the right time right place all of that um but you know, for me, it was how can I elevate this to the next level, right? So there is creativity in landscape photography, of course. But for example, with the image on the right, you know, with the with the with, with, you know, this was I think minus twenty five degrees. The the sunset you see on the on the right with the snow in the foreground. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and I was like, okay, what if, because you have these wild or semi-wild Icelandic horses, right? So I said, what if, you know, in this image, I had a, I had a horse standing there in the middle of it, you know, won't it be better? So <laughs> the landscape on its own is great, but what else can I add to it? And this, you'll see, you know, through my photos, I slowly started thinking of this thing where, great, I love the landscape, but, you know, what else can I add to it, right? So... Um, so this this was you know the, the travel journey that started and I hope uh, later you will see what I mean by why can't I have a horse in this because I was lucky one day uh, next day in the evening again I think it was minus 27 that night um, and you know the sunset colors are absolutely stunning as you know um, in, in Iceland because of the because of where it is in terms of its latitude and this was in the death of winter and I was able to get a couple of horses in in, in that height and I'll, I'll share that with you very very soon um sorry was there a question I said it's beautiful thank you thank you I mean you know it was always a dream when you you know to go to Iceland you see all these pictures and you know I must say the place is every I mean day. you know it was always a dream when you it's um every bit as as beautiful as it looks do we have an issue with the audio is that okay it is okay great okay um and then you know when you talk about travel photography i i really did you know everywhere i went you'll see this is f furthest away from unless you call humans wildlife <laughs> this is furthest from <laughs> wildlife you see but i really took my camera everywhere this is in pune you know again exploring kind of uh what travel photography can do and everybody knows you have these kind of wrestling khadas and things like that so really what i'm trying to say is you know there is a you know a lot of photographers who clearly focus on one type of photography but they didn't get there overnight you know it takes time it takes you know um you years and years of really figuring out what you want so travel was a big passion and you know i started with this kind of stuff um of course you know here well camels are not really wild as such but you know the i loved of course um traveling within india and taking taking photos and these are some of my favorite photos to be honest in terms of travel in fact the one on the right uh, was a runner-up in the in the Macquarie um, International Photography Awards. Uh, I think it's an Australian photography um, uh, or, or Australian-based organization. But uh, I think I think they've stopped their awards now. But 2014 or 15, uh, this was uh, runner-up globally in, in that competition. Um, so you know, explored this type of thing as well. Again, the interaction between humans and animals. Uh, this this one uh, this photo won me uh, uh, in the UK. Um, I was I was third in in a again an international photography competition, the Times Group um, photo travel photo awards. And then with that, I was able to travel to South Africa on, on a trip and, and took wildlife photos in South Africa. So it was another way to, to be able to travel somewhere else to, to get, you know, photos of, of wildlife. Um, you, you name it, as I said, travel. This is Abu Dhabi. I was based in the Middle East. So, so did, did some of that as well. Um, um, Japan, um, this was four years ago. Again, I found myself gravitating towards um you know the deer uh, for, for for those of you who've been to to, Japan, to kyoto and and nara park out there you just can't miss the deer but again for me it was you know how can i get a shot that is different not just you know a very close up because you know the deer there are so friendly they're, they're almost too friendly they, they come up to you they ask you for food and you know it becomes quite a quite difficult to get rid of them to be honest but uh, because it was autumn i said you know what's the best way i can i can get a uh, a bit you know something that is different and go go be, go back and not really uh, have a wide angle thrust into into the, into the deer's face mm -hmm. um so that was that was japan um and then china again you know actually one of my favorite favorite places to travel to china uh, absolutely love the type of things you can do there you'll see again more of landscape but there's an additional element now in this photograph is you can you can see the mist and the fog rising in the back and and you'll see and and you know nisha we've discussed this yep. with the light and mist it's it is i think my favorite element you know in terms of weather in terms of a photo i mean um I, unfortunately sometimes if, if there is no mist i can't take photos you know it's come it's become like that now. um 
but i started seeing this you know i started seeing okay there's a landscape there's travel photography what else can we add you know animals yeah one thing mist another thing i just think you know what mist gives you in a photo you know you just you just can't replace it with anything else and uh, difficult to of course you know create on your own some effects with light etc you you can do in the studio studio but uh, or you know in photoshop let's say but with mist i think slightly more difficult because of the how unpredictable it is um but again china really wasn't able to do much of wildlife photography as such it was it was this type of you know travel related things this was morocco just another example you know you, you kind of take your camera with you and try and explore everything you can um i think that's um yeah okay so with um with that you know came kind of the end of um me traveling just for travel photography um and then a few years ago um i decided that okay i must go to costa rica you know one of the favorite places uh, for for uh, photography and uh, that's when for the first time i was really able to focus on on um, wildlife photography as such and my whole trip was dedicated to to taking photos of wildlife and hummingbirds like this one i mean you know i, I went there with again very low expectations because um, you know you see a lot of lot of great photos and and you don't want to be under pressure to to be able to get those type of photos um yeah. but at the same time once i went there really you know there are a lot of opportunities and and uh, if you you know know what to do and you know all the guides and everybody's they they know you're there for your wildlife photography so they really help you um and you know as far as possible with my photography i try and do it all uh, <clears throat> in camera so so you know as you know again yeah cameras have come a long way so with this one you know this was i think a 7d at the time you can see you can see that the image is a bit a bit noisy because i had to go beyond 1600 on the iso um but you know um nowadays you know you may not have that problem but 6 7 years ago that that's the camera i could afford at that point in time but i really was happy with the images i came back with and you know i with the images i took i also tried to do some some creative stuff so so the images as such of course this is this is a composite image but each of these these um uh, hummingbirds is one single image which is in camera so it was a kind of a um overcast day so i was really able to uh, get uh, the hummingbird in in silhouette uh, really nothing behind in terms of the sky to to speak of uh needed a high shutter speed of course to to capture the the wings etc uh but then it was just about making it a high key image and putting it together so i really enjoyed it so so then i realized wow you know you have travel and then if you can travel for photos that's absolutely great you know um nothing like it uh and it was you know and still is as i said at the time Uh, passion so so you know i i kind of said okay what else can i do in terms of traveling taking my uh, camera with me getting those you know incredible shots um and that's that's kind of um you know one part of my journey with with my uh, travel and my photography which ended up towards the end being focused on wildlife and and shooting images of of wildlife um and being based in the uk to be to be honest of course traveling is uh, is easy within europe but uh, you know there's a you know, specific wildlife you can get to within europe um but the big focus right with the big focus in this part of the world is landscapes has been landscape especially the uk some of the you know top uk photographers uh, you know really focus on 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 landscapes and because you know the country is small but you, you really get a good good variety of uh, things you can you can shoot um so one was travel and then you know as i said funnel down to okay i i can kind of get good images of of uh, wildlife as well within those beautiful travel settings uh, and the second was okay let's you know let's see locally in the uk what are the landscapes that are available um and you know everything from uh seascapes to kind of long exposures to to all of that um you know tried absolutely everything uh, the great thing the great thing about 
um, the UK is the weather. And, and this is a funny statement because a lot of people don't like uh, the UK weather. But I think um, what you get is, is four distinct seasons. So, you know, right from, you know, spring, summer, autumn and, and winter. And because of the unpredictability of the weather and because of the, you know, the kind of the rain and the low temperatures and the change in temperatures, you also get, uh, you know, misty conditions, foggy conditions, rain at very odd times, and you get, you know, really beautiful light. Uh, and, and I say that because growing up in, in India and, and then uh, you know, I was there in the Middle East for, 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 for two years, not very long. I really hadn't seen that type of light uh, ever before. Maybe on, you know, one morning when I was in Kenya looking at things, but, you know, the mist kind of burned off very quickly. Uh, but the kind of light you get in the UK, really, I hadn't seen before. So that was really exciting for me because exploring that with the landscapes, uh, like in this, this case, um, and then trying to see, you know, how we can get animals into it. Uh, was something, you know, that I was really curious about and really work, wanted to work hard on. Um, so like this image, you know, is taken in winter. Now, you could say this is a landscape image, but you just put two geese somewhere there or two swans in the middle of the image. That's what, you know, it's, again, it's not your traditional wildlife, like, you know, you get in India, yeah. let's say, big game or in Africa. But this is what this country has to offer, right? You, you have to... Yeah. Um, use what you have available locally um so that's what i was trying to do with with these landscapes um okay so now wow. here we go you know is this landscape is this wildlife right um, <laughs> <laughs> um for me you know this is a bit of both but this is the type of stuff i i really like you know um i really and and you know a lot of photographers do it nowadays but uh big lenses are great you can really focus on the animal behavior and, and really get into details. Uh, but for me, stepping back a little, especially when you have this kind of scene, you know, look at the sky, look at the mist and the trees uh, and the two deer there. You know, this was actually, I think, shot on a, on a 7200 at 70. In fact, I wanted it a bit more, um, you know, a, a smaller um, telephoto even you know, than that but um i'd step back i you know i went as far as i could to capture this scene and um, this is what then really got me into my um the type of photos i do with with wildlife is is looking at the whole scene as a you know as as a compass as, as a you know uh what you see with your eyes um seeing you know what wildlife you find within it and making sure that you show the interaction or the habitat that that it is based in. So, um, and I've seen you know incredible images, of course, including um, yours, I think, uh, Nisha for, for for lions and and zebras, and you know with in, in the in the African uh, plains and and at Mara with you know you can really step back with giraffes uh, and elephants with the sun or let's say. Uh, Kilimanjaro in the background that's what of course you, you don't have those kind of big animals or a mountain here anywhere that big but you know if you can show that kind of thing with with what you have available that's really my what, what I try and do with my photography great yeah um, here's another scene now no wow. deer here <laughs> but um there are, uh, this is one of them. I mean, the, the, so for example, you know, unfortunately what has happened in, in the UK is really the biggest um, mammal, land mammal we have is the red deer. Okay, so it's a pretty large okay. deer and, and it's good, uh, but nothing, you know, like India where you have these, uh, or, or Africa with a big five. Um, so you get, you know, cows and sheep and all that. They're not wild at all. So let's not talk about them. But this kind of landscape, you know, you try and um, what you can do is you can get birds, you know, flying into into this like a group of starlings. There's thousands of them. Um, and so, of course, this this was shot on a day when I, I couldn't get any starlings on, on the morning. But that for me is, is the goal when it comes to, let's say, you know, shooting atmospheric or, or really um, you know, wildlife photography in that sense that, that tells a story. Um, 
and to drastically change this what i also explored with my with my landscapes was cityscapes okay so really kind of stark cityscapes and then you know for me it looks great and it's generally black and white as you can see uh, it really didn't do it for me right so this kind of thing as well i explored you see a lot of it around being in london you know one of these kind of really built up cities in some areas you, you always want to do this type of thing but it really you know it was good but it it really didn't do it for me and and i realized okay you know what i need to go back step back a little and see what i really want to do because it was a lot of photographers in 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 london keep doing this okay and i i had i do have very kind of unique shots like this shot you know i don't think many people have because i had access to this building one of the tallest buildings in london uh and not, not many people had access to this building so um there is uniqueness in these but i really i realized you know I, i love wildlife so i stuck to that kind of thing um great uh, maybe we take a bit of a pause anisha <laughs> anything that uh, else you know you, you can you want to ask or we can discuss before i get into some other photos um we just uh, i mean uh, we have a bunch of uh, hellos from couple of people uh, roberto Hello. amaya uh, tapati and awesome shots and you know a great opportunity kind of the comments then anand prasad i think he's a guy from talchapur in rajasthan oh wow yeah hi, great no hi everyone hi everyone nice to nice to have you all here always good to talk to like minded people um you know always good to um, talk to people who love wildlife as as i keep saying the purest love you can have is first love for food okay <laughs> that yes. is the first and then yes. and then i my life you know so that is so really really good to to be able to share uh, this and then thanks again post trails for for giving me this platform okay. so um yeah the first half you know i've talked about my story how i've gone about things you know started out um travel photography landscape photography city photography and then you know realized after i'd say 6 7 years of um exploration and serious um where, where photography was a serious passion i realized okay you know wildlife is is what i really like uh what i want to do um and I, as such you know the, as i said earlier the uk what i think is is important here is uh, to understand you know what it really means in terms of you know wildlife photography because a lot of us want to go to these amazing you know locations around the world and you know there are many 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 of them. i want to go for example if you asked me i'm i'm going to preempt this question in in okay i'll leave that for later but i have so many places i want to go to you know whether it's you know um, tanzania or 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 rwanda or you know go to finland to shoot the bears go to hokkaido do this go to i know south america for for the pumas um go to india even i haven't been to a other than you know when i was 8 or 9 years old i haven't been to a uh kind of tiger reserve in india in, in the last 20 30 years so you know there's a lot i want to do and travel and and uh, kind of uh, shoot in terms of uh, wildlife but what i realized over the years is what is important as we all know is to understand the animals understand the birds understand their behaviors first before you get a good good image right um and yes you can read up about it and and you know um you can talk to someone about it and and see videos of it these days and understand them but nothing beats experience on the field right and how are you going to get that experience on the field time and again um unless you have you know endless amount of money and and can you can keep traveling for this you know, i i certainly don't so i i can't keep going every month to to kenya let's say but um i what i can do is go locally i can go 5 yeah. miles away 10 miles away maybe 50 miles away every weekend go to this you know uh, places nearby where i spot local wildlife local deer um i look at birds i look at insects i look at something that's local that i can really focus on and and be 
uh, become an expert on. And and I have seen so many, you know, photographers here in the UK, and you've also seen them, I'm sure, all over the world on, on through social media, etc. For you know, focusing on insects. Within insects, some people focus only on spiders, only on lizards. Uh, within birds, you focus only on certain birds. That really gives you an edge over over somebody else. And I'm not saying you know don't do the occasional trip and and look at you know other types of animals and wildlife but really you know for me it was what can i find locally you know fine i just have to accept that i'm not living in in a nearer tiger reserve i'm just not i'm living in a place where you know if i'm i'd be happy if i get to see a fox or a rabbit or a deer you know or yeah. um swans for example now in india i know you don't get to see swans very often so here swan is so common uh but india you know it's not in india you you know as someone keeps you know said whether it's monkeys or neil guy or you know some of these other animals are so common where you, you don't you just don't see them here so i've tried to focus you know on, uh, at my end on local animals uh deer for me biggest mammal in in this part of the world uh, so really focused on deer you'll see more, a lot of my photography is deer birds uh, and swans especially so we'll talk about this now um, and you know geese um, and some of the geese I know because I went to Bharatpur a few years ago and you know there was uh, I think it was uh, not just Canada geese but but a few others uh, a few mallards as well where you know the guide kept telling me that it's not that common to have them here but here you know in the uk i found them very common so also in this kind of light you know so with the mist and you can see there's frost in the background this is just you know i'm saying just because really very honestly this kind of scene can happen almost every day you just have to be there you just have to get these conditions you have to have that sky in the background and the mist but unless you know the place unless you can really uh, call yourself an expert in that uh, you know about the birds so i know for example in this lake when the birds will take off when they land at what time of the day i almost you know can tell you every month what is going to happen uh, that really i feel gives me an edge and you know i'm able to get these kind of shots so um, so i'll just take you through some of my bird photos and then of course and swans because they are my favorite and then uh, deer and then at the end, I'll share with you some of my favorite uh, images. Uh, I, you know, at the moment, ten of my favorite images. Thank you. Is that okay, Nisha? Wonderful. Great. Another one, Canada geese once again. That was um, kind of winter. This is summer. Um, and one other thing with with birds and water for me is, if there is a reflection, you know you can't you will just not be able to take me away from that spot i absolutely love reflections i mean i think it's really if your image is you know um, kind of eight out of ten i think with a reflection it becomes 16 out of 10 you know, it just just doubles everything i absolutely love it so uh, again you will see in most of my images and and sorry if you're bored of the mist but i absolutely love the mist and and in this case again with reflections as well i think it really uh, simplifies the image, really focuses on the subject. Um, and again, another reason why <clears throat> I pull back, uh, I don't really, I could have zoomed into, you know, I could have taken a 400 mm lens and zoomed into three birds uh, on this, but, you know, seeing it like this uh, really, really, um, yeah, really, you know, tells a story. Yeah. Uh, again, this was one of my early images I took early, even when, you know, eight, nine years ago. Um, and, you know, I think with this, yeah, you can see there's no mist. But what I really liked was the type of light. I've not done anything to this image, but to be honest, it's just the way the light hit the pond. You know, you had these uh, younger swans. So they're, they're kind of sub-adult cygnets uh, with the older swan. And, and the colors on the younger ones are always, you know, until they become adult, they're... They are, um, yeah. they're they are yeah brownish Brown you know, ugly. yeah yeah you know ugly duckling and all that <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah they're, they're still very beautiful uh so you'll see a few more swan images now going forward i i you know swans in in the uk are the most i think they've been i think the most common subject okay in in the uk definitely when it comes to birds 100 percent the most common because they are protected so let me tell you a small story as well 
uh, they, they are in the uk they are uh, considered to be all swans are owned owned by the royal family by the queen oh, okay. wherever they are okay so okay. one story this i experienced myself is i was on the train to work a few years ago and suddenly you know the train kind of stopped and and you know everybody is checking twitter what the train company was saying and the actual tweet was i'm not joking about this that there's a swan on the tracks okay <laughs> yes and until the swan because you you also can't forcefully move it you're not allowed to do that so until the swan moves the the train is stopped okay and i mean think about that we're talking about you know london financial capital of the world and all of that there are people going into work you know <laughs> thousands of people going into work but the trains have to stop because there's a swan on the tracks now that, that so so swan is very 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 uh, uh, kind of respected and revered and you just you can't touch swans okay in this country it's uh, it's, it's uh, protected by by law and it belongs to the to the royal family um biggest one of the biggest um flying birds i think uh, definitely you know in 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 the uk but also uh, globally uh, the big the biggest swans can reach up to 13 uh, 14 kilos uh, there's this story in the uk that uh, uh, you know a flying swan kind of at full speed if it hits you it hits a human being you know they can break the arm and it's possible i think you know imagine a stone of 10 plus kilo stone hitting you at real speed in your arm <laughs> so it is really going to hurt um yeah. they're very aggressive uh, swans you know they look beautiful but you know everybody here knows that they're really really aggressive birds uh they fight with dogs and you know you you have to be very careful with them um especially when they have signets around them uh, but of course incredibly graceful right you know the whole kind of breeding cycle and you know um they go through a mating dance they copy each other in the dance and then uh, after they mate they have a, i think it's a 42 day uh, incubation period with the with the eggs and then the signets are born and the signets ride they're one of the you know bird um Uh, families that the signets you know the small ride on the back of the swan which i find absolutely i can't take my eyes, eyes off that i'll show you a couple of photos shortly uh, but also you know i've spent a lot of time exploring swan behavior so the picture on the right for example with this signet trying to eat from uh, the the mother's mouth with that weed hanging is not very common it's it doesn't happen and i've explored seven or eight different ponds but on this specific pond every year the new signets you know try and eat from the mother like this no other pond i've i've observed this kind of thing so this is where you know this local knowledge comes in if this kind of image i i tried for seven or eight years in different places i've not got it but there is one pond there is this one couple of swans and swans mate for life so that couple uh, always feeds its young young uh, you know, signets like that which i find you know absolutely fascinating um so that's a bit of a swan background for you um you. again you know for me yes the, the the of course i hope you can see that i love the love the subject and the the birds and i have read up about them but also being able to get them in in a setting that you know gives you an idea of you know the the habitat and where they are and as i said going back to my point about landscape i love landscape photography I, you know i did it and you know but even without the swans this this would be a great image you know you have these trees and there's a, a lovely reflection early autumn colors i mean you know a bit dark a bit mysterious but add the swans and you know the image again i feel takes it to to another level so um it's about being able to add these additional elements into 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 your photography so that's that's one of them um more swans uh, on the left one of my favorite swan images uh it's a sunrise uh and this couple and now unfortunately i think this couple is uh, because with swans what happens is if one of the uh, partner dies the other one actually dies of sorrow i mean it's it's a real thing because 
they don't yeah it's very sad they don't um, they don't mate with any other swan uh, they keep looking for the partner who's dead and then ultimately they just have a very sad uh, you know the eating disorders and all of that and they are chased out of the lake they are on and they basically they are thrown out of uh, they basically can't uh, you know live a normal life uh, so this this pair is now no more unfortunately but you know I was very happy they were able to give me this kind of image with a sunrise just above the head and uh, again not it wouldn't have been possible without me knowing where they were where to find them or the fact that the sunrise happens right behind that spot of course i had to be lucky that they swim there and they stand in the water and all that um and then on the right a bit of a interaction between my two favorite subjects those are young young red deer you can see the antlers are just starting to grow and uh, this is around june or june or july when the young cygnets are just being born and the swan was uh, you know they do the stretch and you try and capture the I, lo I love when they do the stretch because you can see their size yeah. um so that's a just a lucky moment that I, that I was able to capture um again you know with with um you know local wildlife coots and and moor hens and things again you know i don't think in india they're as common but here you talk about a coot and a moor and people just don't like it you know because there's so many so many so many but again you know trying to get them in in different moments and exploring reflections again so you know reflections may still keep hearing me say these things uh, but i you know it's it's something i can't can't resist so with the swan on the right um you know you can see the wings are just brushing the water uh, as it's you know it's early morning just sunrise had just happened um it, i can't stop photographing i mean there are so i mean there are million ways you can photograph swans they're always beautiful so this is uh, an example of of that you know um everyone's favorite subject in spring when you have the swans have babies the cygnets they look extremely cute you know they are really uh, characterful and and you know again here of course the reflection is is great uh, but also you can see that the water is yellow that's because you know you have this i uh, had this there's a tree there uh, in that particular spot that has these leaves that are uh, it's not yet autumn by the way so this is not autumn colors it's just that the leaves are um, are of that type of color so you know i tried to capture that um more reflections and this is a is a very good example of really you know being this pond where i took this these images is you know 15 minutes walking from my place okay so really i mean you know can't get more local but you know look at the images i okay you know not being immortal but i i you know the great right in the sense that yeah if, if anyone captured them i would say it's great um you have the you know the moor hens on the right i've been looking for this kind of image forever you know this backlit you know with the them fighting they're really very fierce when they fight uh i missed the reflection a bit at the bottom but you know you can't get everything right you can't get everything so very 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 happy with that image you know i i waited again i just knew on the pond i knew where the sun would rise and i knew if that happened in that spot i would just absolutely you know be able to nail that image the second one again uh spent a few shots trying to get it but even i don't know how i got that image i'll be honest sometimes you just have to accept it's luck you know that reflection with the wing and the water is just magical i mean i couldn't believe it when i got it but the only thing i can say is i planned it i knew that these uh, uh i think they're tufted ducks if i'm not wrong yeah that they they are uh, they keep moving up and down in on that pond and a particular spot on the pond you get some light in the evening so i was able to capture that um swans again um yeah won't spend yeah. much time telling you my love about swans but sunrise reflection mist i can't you can't take you know, <laughs> any of those things um thank you um also did a few you know photos at at bharatpur so you know this is this is one of them 
uh, I just went there once, but you know, I, I got a few interesting shots. All right, and I think I got quite a few interesting shots. Again, being a bit creative, uh, this bird really allows you to be creative because of its neck. Uh, just trying to frame it in a way, you know, that is uh, that is a bit uh, different or unusual. So, so that was one of them. Um, and then an example of sorry for the watermark there, but an example of what I try and do. You know, if I have a landscape on the left right which is great on its own you can see the sunrise you can see uh the mist and the water but of course then add the swan to it with with the sunrise at the back i feel you know that's it you have your you have your uh, amazing image that's that's my you know uh, style so to say uh and as i said finally i i, I will share images of uh, um signets with there uh, on, on the mother's back. I mean, when you see this, you will see how special it is. Those of you who had the chance to see it in real life, um, you know you know how it how it amazing it looks. Um, again, you know there are some swans, especially who are a bit older. Uh, they, they live about ten plus years, but once they are, you know, they have mated for two or three years. That's when they they are able to do this kind of behavior. Um, I've seen at most five signets being carried on the back. I think on the right you have four, if I'm not wrong, or maybe five. One is looking down, um, but it's it's always special when this when this happens. It's beautiful. Right. Um, yes. So that was you know some of the you know my focus on 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 birds and and uh, you know reflections with birds and now kind of to my uh, most favorite animal and, and my <laughs> photography with, with deer. Um, so again, you know, with deer, I'd like to say that uh, there are only one or two species of deer that are uh, indigenous to, to the UK. So you have roe deer, and I think one, you know, it's a family called, I think, um, species called Munjack. I think Munjack is, is uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I may be wrong, but roe deer definitely is, is a native UK species. All the other species in the UK are, they were brought in the, you know, either in with the Norman invasion in the 11th century or, you know, because kings after that wanted to hunt them. They made deer parks. In fact, some of my photos are from deer parks, big parks, but they were made because the kings wanted to go out and do hunting with the, you know, to shoot the deer um, with their, uh, yeah, guns at the time. Um, so, so you know, as such, deer is not a native species, but you know, over the years, it has become quite common all around here in the UK. Definitely, Ireland, you have a different, you know, type of, uh, you know, red deer, but a different uh, branch of of those families. And then in the north of the country, in Scotland as well, you have these uh, red deer. So, uh, a lot of the photos you will see are red deer, but you know, I also look at fallow deer. Um, I photographed roe deer in, in bluebells as well, uh, and the other, I think there's a uh, Sika, Munjak, and I think it's called Chinese water deer. Those I haven't been able to photograph yet, uh, but maybe, maybe someday. Um, yes, so with deer, for sure, because, you know, they are large, right? They are la large relatively you can uh, you're able to really get them get the habitat and the surrounding but also get them quite prominent in the in the photograph so if you have that's why swans i think work well as they're quite big but if you take a smaller animal you know like a rabbit or you take on the water you take a smaller duck sometimes you step back it's it's difficult to um get a very you know um to get all the environment and the habitat in but also get the animal in because they're quite small but with deer luckily you know they're, they're big enough to, to be able to get this type of image so this was you know shot on a late uh, summer kind of just before autumn early morning i know this wood very well i keep going back in fact i'll be there tomorrow morning hopefully uh, the sun rises first into this wood so the 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 whole place uh, the reserve is is that you have uh, you know uh, some open land behind this this is the first bit of woods that it gets so the sun first filters through here uh, i've often got a lot of questions from people oh how do you photoshop the rays into the photograph there, there is no i 
my photoshop skills are not that good let me tell you that that much you know um this is all kind of natural uh, again and, and most of it is when people haven't seen like i i didn't know you know 10 years you know, even seven eight years ago this was possible i had never seen like a mist like this i'd never been in a forest where it was misty and the sun filters through you so you see you know bambi and you see these uh, cartoons and all that and you think oh it looks fairy tale and beautiful but maybe it's not possible it's possible it's just you know you you have to know where to go you have to know uh kind of when the mist will come you have to be able to predict a bit you know kind of when the mist will happen uh so just to give you an idea typically of course it's about temperatures and it's about wind patterns so and the dew point so typically if the wind is below let's say two or three miles per hour if there's more than a 10 degree centigrade difference between the the temperatures overnight and and in the morning uh and the dew dew point is the same as the as the temperature uh sorry getting a bit technical but <laughs> that's what you need to kind of do uh in the uk everybody talks about the weather always everybody now first thing you ask someone oh yeah you know, where's the how's the weather how's the weather but th that's what you know if you study the weather a bit you can you can come across this so um yeah i i kind of you know really follow the weather weather very closely to to get these kind of images one more wow uh, this was uh yeah highly commended in the british wildlife photography awards four, four years ago um so here actually you know the, and by the way the horizon is uh it's not it's a straight the the land goes up towards the right okay so i'm not okay. it's not the wrong to the horizon just, just to be sure it is a it is a slope going up um uh, with this one you know i uh, again i i knew that um so this is you know the, the field i talked about this is one of the first field uh, trees there i knew that you know the light will come through there what is also hoping that this deer because when in spring and summer when the you know leaves are fresh uh, their feet they're quite tall so in fact all of these trees you'll see the flat you know the this is a flat line that is because the deer have been feeding on it okay, oh, okay. that is very interesting so i was hoping you know i could get this and they would they would feed on these lower branches uh and i was really lucky i got it uh, i mean yeah i mean the look at the light in the trees it's like how can you not get up at four in the morning to see this you know <laughs> you have to do it um so yeah one of my favorite photos um this is a very kind of sad photo actually so um again i didn't know it when i took the photo so you see the smoke you know behind yes. is actually um i did i didn't realize what it was you know and that's okay let me take so beautiful of course the deer and the, the small one here very nice uh but later i realized that that smoke uh and i have kind of given this image up for, in for charity and all of that it was uh, the worst uh, kind of uh building kind of uh, you know basically there was a massive 20 25 story or even taller uh building that was went on fire uh and uh, more than 100 150 people that lost their lives that day so i didn't know it you know when this happened i didn't know it and then later when i got home i read the papers this was i think 4 in the morning or 4 30 in the morning so very very poignant you know kind of image uh in a way i was happy you know that i could capture it so that you know i could give it to charity but a very sad thing that happened with, the, with that smoke uh, in the background uh, but i think it was the worst uh, worst building uh, residential building disaster in, in the uk history that one okay so sad story on that um this is in autumn again you know i never miss the chance with the light that deer is basically um the stag is doing its the roaring or the bellowing that they do to attract females and also to uh, fight away other males so really you know when you hear of course lions and tigers roaring it's great if you hear a deer roar as well you will be surprised you know you kind of shake in your pants you know it really it it is loud and it is scary okay and you can see the antlers you know how sharp they are you want to really stay away yeah. from this um yeah you you can see you know if you go on instagram and look, there are images you know with you people you know focus closely on the deer and of course it will look amazing if the whole picture was only that that deer but for me stepping back a little and looking at this whole scene just just felt uh, the right thing to do you know it is amazing
Yeah, and I can still remember, you know, when this was happening. It is a wood, right? There are trees. You can see it echoing. You can hear it echoing in the wood. It's just, uh, it's just haunting, you know, absolutely haunting. Um, another one, you know, very kind of, kind of Alice in Wonderland type of feel. Very different light one on summer morning, you know, just small deer. As I said, you can. See, in fact, I feel if an image is very striking that you like it. Yeah. If the subject is small, the smaller the subject and if the image is still striking means, you know, I've been successful. So if I can get, if I had a dragonfly instead of the deer and people still like the image means it's a great wildlife image. I, mean, I like to really step away and kind of show you how it all feels like. I feel like this is also how the animals look at it. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful kind of a setting. Uh, another one. Um, this guy was just about to roar uh, and you know love the little details with the these other female ones you know looking here and there and this guy just standing there waiting waiting to to kind of um, to get his uh, group of females um, a few more again exploring you know uh, with different type of light on the right these are fallow deer these are fallow deer smaller and you will see they have dots and a bit different and on the left, of course, a uh, red deer female is called a hind. So hind and, and the little one, I think, is called a foe. So, yeah. Um, again, fallow deer. One more uh, very, a very kind of special image for me personally in the wood. Early morning, this is springtime. Uh, they are just about to lose the antlers. Uh, and they just kind of, you know, play fight with each other. So they were just doing that. And I was able to... Uh, get this uh, just at the at the right moment there. Um, this was on the same day um, that I took the last image. Uh, just uh, before that one, though, sunrise. Uh, difficult to balance this one. I mean, I know we've not talked technical photography. Maybe I'll have some questions later. But getting it with the sunrise and and doing that was uh, quite uh, quite interesting. I, you know. The, Deer are not, you know, very kind of characteristic in terms of behavior. They have a few behavior patterns that are characteristic, but this one, one of these is, you know, standing up and eating uh, the leaves there. So um, this is a very standard, you know, this could be, I feel like sometimes some of these could be in the African savanna, you know, with the yeah. plains. Um, but uh, just in spring, you can see the velvet on the antlers uh, of the deer. It's not yet pointed. It's quite uh, furry and soft. Uh, but also the whole scene is quite soft. Uh, and, you know, uh, with the kind of grass in front, which is white. And so, yeah, it was a nice, uh, nice morning on this one. Fallow deer again. I don't know if you can spot. You should be able to see the frost on the grass. So this is one thing you know that I I can't get anywhere else. At least you know in definitely not in uh, India that much. Of course not in Africa. You know with the with the frost and the mist and the light, uh, all of it coming together. Plus of course this guy. Uh, this is late spring. Suddenly we had one day you know freezing temperatures below zero. He lost oh. one of his antlers. You know. They will grow back, of course. They will grow back, but uh, you know it was good to get a single, single antler fellow here. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I just want to share kind of some favorite images. Uh, but you know, any if if there are any uh, questions on the deer, we can we can of course talk about them after after I share these. Is that okay, Nisha? Yeah, that's okay. We have some beautiful comments, but no questions as such. Okay, great, <laughs> great. <laughs> Okay, just a few, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of time as well. Um, quickly, no, just are, are we okay with time? Yes, we are okay with time. Good, okay. Um, okay, this one, you know, is um, favorite personally because this was one of the earliest images, you know, uh, seven, eight years ago now that I got of, uh, you know, fully kind of grown adult uh, stag. Um, the first time I really got uh, a, a stag in conditions like this, just, you know, before autumn, you can see the leaves are turning. So personally, for me, it was like, wow, you know, you can get this kind of photo if you are patient and if you know where to, where to look. And so it's not, you know, from a, a technical or maybe beauty point of view. 
personally i feel i have other images that are better but because this was the first one that i got you know that was really really striking i i really i fell in love with it so this is this is one of those uh, uh, first love kind of kind of things um different right not as i said right not always you know with the big wildlife that's just a gull just again i'm just saying gull every animal is beautiful you know you can't say yes. one is more beautiful than the other but it was really kind of you know this whole narnia type of winter wonderland type of conditions you know one february morning uh the frost was absolutely stunning uh there was a lovely blue light blue gray light you know that uh, <clears throat> in the previous days there was frost but this kind of light was wasn't there on this day you know it was absolutely stunning and uh, this lone kind of gull uh, was sitting there and you know just i just love the mood this image kind of uh, you know makes me feel like for me winter when i think of winter and you know i just think of this kind of uh, a setting so, so that's one favorite one Oh, this one. Okay. Um, uh -huh. I just wanted to give, uh, you know, again, this one um, has been uh, really shared a lot, lot copied and also stolen. There was a company in the US uh, recently for the NBA finals because it was Bucks versus Suns. Uh, I think for those of you who follow NBA in the US, just, you know, Bucks and Suns, just uh, this is the perfect image for that, right? So this one, um, a few years ago, um, I knew that if there is um, kind of a good sunrise uh, on this field, um, but this is a sunrise, by the way. So a lot of people said sunrise, sunset, and this is a single image. Okay, this is not photoshopped or anything like that. Um, I knew that you know I, this is possible uh, to to do. I just have to get the right kind of angle and and get lucky i was lying down for this in the grass you know about 100 meters away from this deer uh, and you can see on the left i got that first i got three or four shots okay i couldn't get any more because then the he ran away but the yeah. first one on the left you know it's a good image of course you know with the sun and all that i was like okay you know can i can i move a bit to the right and and uh, you can see the color of the sun on the left is a little darker than you know more orange because of course it's yeah. maybe 45 50 seconds before the or maybe one minute before the one on the right it had to go up a bit more because i couldn't go lower right i was on the ground yeah. so it had to go up a bit more it took me it took some time moving around patients it was really you know i it was like if i don't get this i never go i'm never going to get it it was uh, like really anxious moments but finally just one shot i was able to get you know that was i think almost perfect in the middle and you know my i think my most it's popular awesome. yeah um so that is that is that i will never forget that moment never um this one um this is my favorite bit of uh, one of the woods that i have locally and um again you know one of the very early ones uh, that i got uh, it was really interesting because again this is the light you can see comes in first uh, you know from from that side from the left into this wood on the right it's you know very quite dark uh, and i always find that fascinating you know you have really lovely glow and you know, orange a warm light on one side of the wood and the other side is dark and, and blue bluish rather uh, but this you know stag really you can see also there is um the cobwebs in on the ground and near the twigs beside the stag so again autumn time uh, you know cold morning there'll be dew drops of course on those cobwebs or those spider webs and then uh, this guy decides to kind of walk into this frame as i said this image even without the stag is beautiful you know as a landscape yeah. event yeah, but with that stag you know just uh, it was uh, special this one uh not wildlife okay this is not wildlife but this image uh well, it was runner up in the uk La landscape photography of the year award landscape photographer of the year awards i don't know how this happened okay this is uh this is uh this is one location that i go to and and you know there are birds and all of that i think this these two were surveying the lake or counting the birds or some they are they are official i think this guy on the who's growing you can see some bullets some 
gun, you know, bullets in his on his. I don't know what it is, but I think they were doing some survey. For once only this has happened in ten years, you know, never again I've seen this. Uh, yeah, it was just something else for me. I mean, you know, one of those special images again. Of course, won an award as well, so that was a kind of icing on the cake. Uh, but a uh, very unique image for me with the reflection of those trees and this this boat that is it just seems like it just I, they just came there for me and then went away they were there for 10 minutes i was the only one that morning taking photos here and i was the only one who got this so it's a really really unique one yeah not wildlife okay but i was there to take wildlife photos and i got this so you know it, it counts it counts that was your time sorry that was your time. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Um, again, another one. Since we're talking, you know, not see camels. I know camels can be quite unpredictable, and they are, uh, you know, they are tame. But you know, I think they can be quite wild. So I'm going to, you know, use that. I'm going to be a little naughty and say this is kind of half wild or whatever it is. And this was Pushkar, of course. For those of you who, who are from India or who have been to, to Pushkar, again, are lots of photo opportunities in Pushkar, but what really, this one, one of the times where I really used my telephoto lens, 300mm plus, I think, I just you know wanted to focus on, zoom in and get that telephoto compression on certain scenes, you know, to, to give it a different feel. It's like that human being is completely lost in this, in all the camels, you know, so, uh, and uh, you, you saw the other image that I took that, that won me an award, but this was another favorite one there. I just love the color of the coats of the camels. They're so different and dwarfed, you know, that human being is completely dwarfed by all of them. Um, here we go. That, if you remember my Iceland story, this is this is the kind of uh, when I got lucky. So you can get a landscape and beautiful thing in Iceland and the lovely light. Uh, but to be able to get some animals there, this was minus, as I said, minus 26 or minus 27 at this time. Just before sunset, I can't remember, I think 3 o'clock or 3.30 sunset at that time in February or January. In the north of Iceland, near a place called Mivatan, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but Mivatan is uh, is where this was taken. You get these uh, these horses, as I said, they're semi wild. So during the summer and spring months, the the farmers make them work, and then during winter and they, they leave them, let them free, much like the reindeer you get in in Finland, you know. Um, so you, they leave them free. I think you know they graze wherever they want to, and then they come back. Um, but yeah, they, and you know, they're, they're, because they're semi-wild, they, they, you can approach them. They're not too, uh, they're quite friendly, not very friendly, you know, but you can, you can see I'm not too far away from them. Uh, yeah. But to get that light in the background and, you know, this one looking away at me, it's like, if I was to take this photo from the other side, it would be an exact opposite of this image. Okay. That, so that's kind of what really struck me about this. It's like a, it's flipped, you know flip like a flipped image but you know of course i got it from this side and of course the sunset is is, is behind these horses so a uh, real real favorite uh, favorite one this is a moment type of you know capture i hope you wow. can see the gear there yeah um, it's not the most sharp okay um again sometimes with wildlife or any image you know it doesn't have to be sharp or it's just what you captured in the moment this one um I've got a few images of this stream and the deer crossing this stream. But on this occasion, you know, he was jumping and I have one in the middle of the air. But, you know, this one for me, you know, when it just takes off, it took, uh, yeah, it landed somewhere in the middle of the stream, didn't cross the whole thing. But uh, it was like a dream. I mean, you know, I was there and it just happened within five seconds and everything was gone. Um, so um, it, this is what more of a kind of vision kind of memory that just happened and you know i remember it uh, uh, so well but again after this i've never seen this happen in this place so you know one of those things where uh, it's unique for that reason um this one again very popular you would have seen it uh, on social media everywhere i've shared it in the past it has featured in many calendars um commended in the British Wildlife Photography Awards uh, a few years ago, two years ago, I think. But that year, there were no awards. So they said, OK, let's just use it for the calendar. Uh, spring morning, you can see the antlers are just with the velvet. That's why they're shining. That's why they're rim lit. Uh, 
uh, of course, you know, you can see in one spot. That, so there is mist in the background, but what you see around the deer is not really mist. It's also their breath, okay, condensation that's happening and, uh, uh, you know, gives it, of course, they're, they're breathing hard in the morning, you know, not hard necessarily, but no wind. So, so that breath is just hanging out, hanging around them. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the whole formation and uh, they just, uh, you know, the way they kind of one stood up and three sitting down, it just uh, was yeah. again a dream, dream image, that one. And I think I have two more or maybe this one. Um, wow. um, yeah, some people could say, well, not, I missed it because the sun is not in between the antlers. But, you know, you can't always get that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's. Um, I, I yeah, and that was not actually. If you, if I, if I could kind of take you to how I shot this image, and when I was sitting, it, it was not possible to get in it between the antlers because every time I moved, the deer also kind of, of course, mm -hmm. knows what on static, you know. And and um, if I couldn't move to the right, I could not move to the right because there was a tree, and that, this is the best kind of spot I could get really because if I move more to the left, the sun of course goes to the right. So, yeah, it was like you know the the deer has pierced the sun with the with its antlers and so you know and, and it was you know on this small hill you know type of thing uh so it was just uh you know kind of clear shot with just the sun and the, and the stag so quite a striking one and i think i have a final one to share with, with you here we go wow. um, yeah this one is really 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 special for me um I this there's a local company here in the UK, the biggest kind of photography retailer in the UK called Wex. Wex, you may have heard of it. So they do a <clears throat> photography competition, and, and this one uh, every every week, and then over the over the 52 weeks you have a winner. So this one uh, was one of the winners in that competition. Um, th this is you know again uh, the result of uh, understanding animal behavior and bird behavior and uh, knowing the location, you know, anticipating the mist, uh, seeing the light, all of those things. So, um, so these are starlings, okay? So for those of you who know starlings, you, you heard about the murmuration, you know, where thousands and hundred thousand starlings all fly together, you know, in one and it looks spectacular. In summer, you find starlings in, in some places in, in the UK uh they go they're quite often around the deer you know eating small things from the deer and the fur yeah. and thing and um the the trick for me was um to be able to get you know them against the light so you can see in some of them that the wings are lit up but also you know getting them around these deer that they're often roaming around so in the background you can see another herd here luckily for me i had this especially these two that were lit up you know with this with this light in the background and they just flew from the left of the screen to the right of the screen i got you know 10 or 15 shots in that in that three second window with a burst you know i got a few shots uh this one for me was uh kind of the, the best one i got uh, yeah, for me it's when I, when I think about summer and my photography in summer this really kind of exemplifies that so uh thought that this is the last kind of favorite image i wanted to share with you thank you amazing image. amazing image thank you it, it, it was really beautiful i mean the way you put it together from the very beginning till where you are right now oh yeah beautiful journey thank you so much nisha thank you um so if i'm going through the messages as i mentioned we started with uh Sinto, then uh, tapati uh, Roberto, everybody is just giving beautiful comments. Uh, Ajesh, uh, Radhakrishnan, and Shaista. Uh, Roy, excellent work. Uh, Tapati, again, Spanish images are amazing, mind blowing. And uh, uh, then there was a guide from uh, in between. I don't see the message right now. Uh, then Krishna Kant is saying hi, then Deepa. Uh, so a bunch of people, Latif, really mind blowing images. So some spectacular, uh, you know, good words about the images. That's what it is. But we have a couple of questions. One, how do you have any tips for getting the race as race when you 
think about the um, technical side so so did you say the rays the the sun rays yes. you mean yes okay so with that you know so um first of all i think you know if if you want to get the rays like like i have i think uh from you know it can only happen when there is some level of kind of humidity or mist or fog okay in in a particular place otherwise unless you have smoke you may have seen when there is smoke you know that can happen it can't happen otherwise so you know it's not possible on a bright day like a, let's say india 40 degrees through the trees it's not going to happen i can tell you that you can do whatever you want with your camera you can go to f16 drop down to the smallest aperture it's not going to happen so first of all it's you know typically early morning okay uh, maybe late night as well late evening as well but early morning when there's a chance of mist face the sun i think a lot of you know you'll see my photos i try and face the sun because uh, it's difficult yeah because you you yeah. can't sometimes control the light and it's straight into your camera but if you can get uh, a good angle among the leaves and among the trees you mm. will see that burst through even with the slight mist you will see it come through uh, so face the sun find a you know a, a sunny day of course but find a, a misty or a you know slightly uh, yeah misty day or, or foggy works best uh, you need something for the sun to filter through so the trees trees are the kind of the best things you'll see because and they need to have enough leaves so those images you can't in the uk you can't take in winter there is no leaves so you know the, you'll see a bright sun but in spring and summer there's enough leaves so the sun is just just filtering through so you can get those star bursts if you reduce your aperture or even if you don't do it if you position yourself correctly uh, you can see that sun sun filtering through um but yeah you you need a bit of mist uh, you need to face the sun and you need uh, you know to be kind of behind some trees that's that's what i can say um and we have a question from latif uh, can you share the tips for the tips of the last image especially the exposure triangle and lens used okay with the with the starlings and the yes. and the deer right uh, for that one again, seventy two hundred lens. We haven't talked about my uh, <laughs> yes. gear as such, but just to let you know, I use a, a Canon full frame. You know, whether it's full frame or not, to be honest, nowadays I'm not sure it matters too much. But anyway, um, Canon full frame. I use a seventy two hundred uh, and a three hundred mm lens. Sometimes longer. I've, I've rented a six hundred mm lens as well. Sometimes. Uh, but generally 7200 because I like to, to step back. So that image was 7200. Um, you can see, you know, with mist, what happens, light bounces off the mist. Okay. So if in normal conditions, let's say you were at 1 by 800 shutter speed with light bouncing off mist, you'd probably have to double that. Okay. Uh, so I can't remember the exact settings at the top of my head, but I think it was 1 by, definitely above 1 by 1600. Okay low on iso obviously because there's enough light so i don't don't really need need the iso uh and because it was far away right i could afford to go very very you know wide open so my 7200 is f4 so i went with f4 okay because uh i could see broadly that the birds and the deer were in the same plane and they were so far away i think maybe 150 200 meters that uh, really, it wouldn't have made that much of a difference, you know, if, if uh, 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 you know, that in terms of uh, kind of out of focus, them, the birds being out of focus. So they were far away enough to, to, to be able to do that. And with, um, with the UK, you have to remember something is we don't, that image, of course, has a lot of light, but generally it's gray, rainy, you don't get too much light. So I'm always used to you know, wide open f4. If it's f2.8, f2.8, because you have to get as much light as you want. In India, you or Africa or other places, you know, it's bright enough, you get enough light. In the UK, even in those woods, you see, you know, there is a nice, you know, all the rays coming through. But uh, I have to keep the the aperture kind of you know wide open because uh, you you need that light to 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 make that image. So high on the shutter speed, low on the ISO, uh, aperture wide open. Uh, but you know what? More than anything else, sorry, I, I'm, I'm not saying that your question is is valid. More than anything else, I just got up at 
three thirty in the morning that day and reach the, the, the correct spot. I'm telling you, you know, you can do. Of course, you need to know your camera. Of course, you need to know all that. But being there at the right place at the right time, which you can only do if you keep going there again and again. If you know your, you know, trade, you you kind of develop it. Uh, yeah. So you make your own luck. You know, people say I got lucky, but you got lucky because you tried 50 times, and then the 51st time you got the image. You know, so you don't forget that that luck is something that you're also building. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is, if there was somebody beside me that morning with that scene, they would have got the same image. The, getting the image wasn't. You know, I'm not going to say it's incredibly okay. Maybe the timing and maybe knowing where they. But again, it's again timing is. I understand the animal knowing where they, again i understand the birds it, it's all about that uh, the camera itself is the tool to, to help you get it um but uh, yeah it's so you know it's it's more about being there and and being able to yeah. get that image. being there and doing the right thing that uh, yeah. doing the right thing part of course you need to have the understanding about what you're doing but otherwise yes your effort yeah. definitely you know add more value yeah uh, so that was the question and uh, any any tips on mist or capturing things on mist on fog or frost in in frog okay so i think um the good thing about fog and mist is you know really that the, the mist does the work for you right so if you have a subject in front most often you know everything else in the background will be you know this whole uh, Kind of getting bokeh and depth of field. Yeah. The mist does it for you. You know, you can you can shoot at f10 and you will get great. You know, <laughs> subject isolated and all that. That is the best thing about it. Uh, but also, it simplifies the the whole scene. So you can highlight, or if you know, if you can, kind of the mist highlights some things and and kind of leaves some things in in uh, that are not properly kind of exposed. Uh, so getting the subject if you have a subject in the mist that's perfect i think what you need to be careful about is um uh and, and you know more often than not focus on the subject you know so metering all of that should be for the subject because if mist tends to bounce off things especially water and it as is in that image you know uh light kind of you, you can really uh like snow for you know that the common mistake with snow you know you always tend to under or overexpose that can happen that can happen with mist uh, mm -hmm. but i'd say the the main thing is to to have to be able to picture what you're going to shoot as i said the mist will make the image already ready for you you know you don't need to really do too much uh, mm -hmm. but then it's being able to see at least with my style of photography what else you can capture in the mist because remember if you have let's say uh, uh, an eagle in the mist on a branch and you just shoot kind of 600 800 mm, mm and the whole eagle fills up the the photo you've not made use of the mist there is no point in that mist other than the isolation but at 800 mm you would have got that isolation anyway so see with the mist what else you can bring into the image so that people can see that there is mist you know that there is that magic that's happening around the subject yeah Great. I think uh, that was the, those were the questions and uh, a lot of uh, sweet, beautiful messages. Brilliant. So, oh, thanks. Thank thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks everyone for the messages. As I said, you know, always uh, good to hear that about your own work, but uh, importantly, you know, that all of you are also kind of wildlife lovers. So always good to learn from each other and, and thank you for, for watching. Thank you. Thank you, Chaitanya. I really appreciate it. I know you are busy and uh, it, it was quite a task for me to get hold of you. <laughs> but no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. Thank Thanks. you so Thanks much for giving me the chance. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. You too. Uh, so that was Chaitanya and his journey UK, India and uh, you know, starting with birds and then going to uh, ideas and mist and some amazing amazing images so uh, that was the journey for today and you all please take care stay safe and we have the next one or the next next one is going to be focusing more on aerial photography uh, using drones um, by Jitun um, um, 
I'm a bit confused about the dates, but I think we have a couple more coming up back to back. I, uh, we shall keep you posted with the dates as well as the uh, people and their stories. Till then, you all please take care. And, you know, COVID is still there. So don't forget, if you haven't got your vaccine, please don't forget, get your vaccines done and stay safe. Take care, stay safe. Bye-bye.